Cronkite became a fixture in American households at a time of crisis in American society. Many Americans found comfort in sitting down on their living room with their newfangled TVs and the new post-war economy of the nuclear family and sat down and turned on their TVs by hand because they didn't have remotes yet. And Cronkite gave them a sense of peace, so much so that he was welcomed literally as a member of the family to most Americans at the time. Now, this phenomenon is kind of lost on us today. The authority with which Cronkite spoke to speak on matters of world news is long gone. And I think, I think we all just know this. We don't live in that era anymore where every single one of us goes home and turns on the exact same thing and you know that all of your peers are watching it, right? You can go to work the next day in the, in the morning and everyone kind of saw the news the night before. That just doesn't, doesn't happen anymore. But we now have this great thing called fake news, this great thing called artificial intelligence and a plethora of alternative sources thanks to the internet and the ease of publishing and the ease of getting your voice out there. Each one of these news sources also happens to claim to be truer and more authoritative than the other. So while you can lament the, the current state of affairs that we, we don't have an authority, what is, I think, more important is that we realize that each of us has authorities that we go to on any, any given topic, whether authors, preachers, teachers, influencers, cultural pundits, each of us is exposed to a myriad of voices, of conflicting voices often, in the public sphere of ideas. Whether we're conscious of it or not, when somebody asks us a question, usually we give an answer based on something that an authority has given to us, no matter where we heard that authority. We don't like to be our own authority. We like to stand on the ground of somebody else. Even in our age of expressive individualism, we all like to follow somebody who we view as trustworthy. And so internally, whether we realize it or not, we assess what we intake. And we assess the worthiness. Think about that word, the worthiness. It is literally worthwhile. We assess the worthiness of these sources that we intake. And this is actually how we gauge authority. So think worthiness and authority are inherently tied together. You wouldn't listen to somebody that you don't think is worthy. Parents, you would not take parenting advice from somebody who, who doesn't have kids or hates kids for that matter. Or if you're, you, know, you come across and you win the lottery and you need a financial advisor, you're probably not going to find a financial advisor that's been bankrupt or is completely broke. You want somebody who has practiced what they preach. We give greater authority to those who've demonstrated their authority through practice. We want visible, tangible signs that if you're going to trust somebody in their parenting advice, you want to see that they at least have kids and it doesn't look like their house is burning down. If you're going to hire a financial advisor, you want to see their proven track record of increasing wealth and at least not losing it. There has to be some sort of authority. We want to know that those that we trust are ultimately not frauds. There's a great fear inside us all. to It takes risk to put our trust in somebody or something, and so we don't want to get burnt in the end. We trust people who prove their value through practice. And so to take us back a few weeks, if you remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, remember Jesus started off Matthew by proclaiming all of these things. Yes, the practices were involved and he was telling us to do practices, but what Matthew recalls at the end was really, really important. So I want to hit on it again before we get to our text. Matthew notes the crowd's response to Jesus in Matthew 7 at the very end. says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. The thing about Jesus that was different in the Sermon on the Mount that the crowds noticed was that he was an authority in and of himself. All of the scribes are rightly pointing to the Old Testament and thus Yahweh, the God of 
the scriptures as their authority. Jesus is doing the same thing by pointing to the scriptures and to the Old Testament. But what he's doing is transforming it and saying, I, I am he. I am he who is. So then immediately we've been in this series of narratives where Jesus comes down from the mountain. And what does he do? Well, he, he demonstrates his authority. He puts what he said into practice. He demonstrates his authority over heaven and earth because he spoke as one who has authority in himself. And now he is going to act as one who has all authority. He demonstrated his authority over earth by calming the chaotic waters of the Sea of Galilee. If you think all the way back to Genesis 1, it talks about the chaos waters of creation. Jesus in the boat, as we saw, calms the chaos waters of Galilee. Then he demonstrates his authority over heaven, or you can think of that as the spiritual realm, right? Things that are not material. Last week we saw him cast demons into swine, plunging them into the very chaos waters, the abyss of the sea. Now Jesus establishes his authority over the most stubborn aspect of creation, the sinful human heart. And in doing so, we'll see that in healing the body, Jesus demonstrates his authority to heal the soul, which is good news for you and for me. So verse 1, getting into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Every time Jesus performs a miracle, there is a, a response from the crowds. Last week, we saw that the townspeople cared more about those stinky little pigs and the lost income, and they asked Jesus to leave. And the interesting thing to note is that in their caring about lost prophets more than the souls of their fellow image bearers, Jesus obeys them. He leaves them. So he kind of is making a zigzag back and forth across Galilee, using the boat as transportation, demonstrating his authority over the waters each time he gets into what could be a life-threatening boat ride in the, in the first century. But he returns now to his ministry center of Capernaum, which is a key travel hub of the region. It's on the, the very top of the Sea of Galilee. So think of Israel at like the center of the ancient world. And you have Africa down here, you have Europe over here, and you have Asia over here. It forms this triangle. And Jesus now is smack dab in the middle of that confluence. So being a key travel hub of the region, travelers from Egypt, Rome, Greece, and the Orient all would have traveled through this past, making it a key cosmopolitan city in the first century. Now it Again, in the age of internet, just like our pluriform information age, we don't have Walter Cronkite and CBS News, but we do have Twitter or X or Instagram or whatever your favorite medium of news. We all know things and we get information. We have viral videos, news spreads fast. We know what happens on the other side of the world before we wake up the next morning. So I think we can fail to appreciate just how fast word is spreading concerning Jesus and his miracles. But the same thing is happening without the internet. These travelers are, are hearing as they travel through the Galilee region and they're hearing, they're saying, hey, did you hear about this Jesus guy? He, he cast out demons from these swine. Or hey, he's healing people. You have to come see him. So as travelers are traveling through the area, news spreads. They talk, and the fame of the miracle worker, Rabbi from Galilee, spreads far and wide throughout the land. Curiosity builds. As we know, we all like to be in the know. We have a fear of missing out. And as we also know, rumors spread. People start talking about Jesus and hypothesizing who he may be. And then gossip pervades. People start spreading false rumors. People from far and wide wanted to see for themselves what Jesus is all about. So then we get big crowds now as he circles back. He gets into the boat to leave the crowds, but every time he lands, we see in the narrative that crowds are back around him. 
And again, we find Jesus doing what he does. He preaches and teaches to all those who have ears to hear. But this time, the crowd is so thick that we can imagine a very small first century home and people are lined up outside the streets hoping to catch a glimpse of Jesus or to see him in the flesh, to see if who they've heard that he is really matches up with who he is in the flesh. So enter the the faithful friends, it says, of the lame man. Now this narrative is so important that all three of the synoptic gospel writers, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all talk about this narrative. And interestingly enough, Matthew's is the, the most succinct. It's the shortest. It leaves out the most detail. But since all scripture is for us, we can look at Mark and Luke to fill out the narrative a little bit more as we hone in on what Matthew's trying to tell us. But Mark and Luke show just how desperate the friends were to get their friend into the presence of Jesus. A person who was born lame in the ancient world was resigned to resting on a dirty mat all day, every day for life. Think dirt, roads, animal carts going, there's gross stuff in the streets, there's no plumbing, and a mat much smaller than this rug that could be picked up on four sides to be carried and set down everywhere you go for your entire life. No wheelchairs, no motor scooters. You're resigned to sitting on a mat. So what your, your legs do is your legs shrivel up. They don't get used. I mean, we, we know this still today. If you don't use muscles, they shrivel up. It'd probably be crooked from sitting on a mat, hunched up. And the streets would have stained and defiled not only the mat, but the man who was sitting on the mat would have been pretty disgusting as well. So think about this desperate man in a filthy, horrible, physical condition. But we see God's kind providence and care for this man in that this lame man had the best of friends. Friends who were willing to risk their own well-being for the well-being of the lame man. Now you ask, why, why are they risking their well-being? Well, Mark and Luke note how they actually physically dug through the mud roof to lower their friend down to Jesus. They are, they are trespassing and they are committing vandalism to get to Jesus. Those, like today, would be crimes. People would be like, don't dig through my roof, right? But Matthew is content to not focus on the efforts of the friends. He simply calmly affirms that they were men of faith to focus so much so on their faith rather than I think their, their efforts. But notice in the other Gospels that their efforts are there as a response to their faith. Their faith in the power of Jesus to heal leads them and their dear friend into the presence of Jesus. The faith of the lame man then is also represented in the faith of his friends. They believe Jesus can heal. And Jesus, as he's done time and time again in recent narratives, they come into the presence of Jesus, and what does he do? He immediately heals him. Or does he? No, he doesn't. Matthew says that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. What an absurd statement given the context. Okay, think about it. You are the the lame man you may say thank you jesus i'm really glad that you can do that but could you also could you also just heal my legs please that's kind of why that's why we came here was for you to heal my legs thank you but i'm I'm asking for something different right i think all of us if we're honest would have some sort of similar response but notice a key a key move that Matthew makes in the narrative and noticing who speaks or rather thinks next. In verse 3 we say, And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? So go away from Jesus' crazy statement. We'll get back to what he's doing. But he forgives the man's sin. The man's probably left there thinking, Great, but I still can't walk. And then all of a sudden we turn to people who to this point had not even been involved. 
the crowds, the bystanders, the scribes, the ones who don't have skin in the game, in this specific situation at least, the, the onlookers who are looking in, not the one who is there wanting to walk for the first time in his life. As far as we can tell, the scribes walked there on their own two feet and can walk just fine. They're not there for Jesus to heal them. Yet they become the focus of the entire narrative, don't they? They hear Jesus forgive the man's sins and immediately their guard goes on red alert. Right? They, have, they have the alert and their, their ears are pricked. The hair on their back rises. Well, why, why is this? What did they hear? They heard Jesus forgive the man's sins. They know the Old Testament. They know Yahweh. They know God. And God creates and God is the only one who can recreate the human heart and thus forgive sin. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, this is God speaking, I, I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. So they hear Jesus speaking as if he is God speaking in Isaiah and their response is their attempt to defend the name of God. So there's, there's a part of it that is okay. They are trying to defend the name of God from false prophets, and in their mind, Jesus is not speaking on behalf of God or as God, but Jesus is speaking against God by assuming power that only God has. They're fine with Jesus preaching and teaching to a point, right? They gather, and they're, they're trying to be the gatekeepers of what he's saying, but they're not stopping him yet to this point. But when he begins to demonstrate his divine prerogatives, that is what has only been given to God to do, they get very, very uneasy. So what does Jesus do to, to quell the situation, to put the fire out? He responds by demonstrating the very divine prerogative by showing the scribes that he actually knows their thoughts. Matthew and Mark uh, and Luke, uh, Luke also say this, that Jesus hears or sees in their hearts. He, he doesn't necessarily hear them talking to themselves, but he perceives in their heart. Which again, just like God is the only one who can forgive sins, God is the only one that can know the thoughts of men. Psalm 94 says, the Lord, the Lord knows the thoughts of man and that they are but a breath in 1 Chronicles 28, David reminds Solomon at the end of David's reign to, to watch out because the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. Kids, can you, can you look to your neighbor and see what your friend is doing? Who's sitting next to you and can you tell me what they're doing? You guys are reading books, writing, eating snacks. Okay, now tell me what your friend is thinking. Eden, can you tell me? No, you can't, right? Only God sees and knows. You can see with your eyes what your friend is doing, but you do not know what your friend is thinking. So when Jesus goes to the scribes and demonstrates that he can see what they're thinking, what must that mean? It means that Jesus is God. And you and I can run the logic here, but the scribes are blind. They don't see it. The scribes fail to perceive what Jesus is doing. So he gives them another chance. It should have been pretty immediate when their hearts get exposed. So he follows up with the charge of blasphemy with a, a really good riddle. For which is easier, verse 5, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? Okay, think about it for a second because it's confusing and riddles confuse me and I had to think through this even a lot. Okay, which one is actually easier to do or which one is actually easier to say to be done? Okay, to us, it is much easier to say your sins are forgiven because we can't verify it, right? That's, that's proclaiming something to be true on the inside that we can't see and immediately demonstrate. And remember, there's a crowd of people around that can call Jesus on his bluff. 
It's easy to make abstract promises that fail to deliver if the results are not tangible to us. We are material. We like verification. So if we say to someone who needs obvious physical healing, be healed, then the results will be apparent. Either that person will be healed or they will not be healed. And the truth of your statement, be healed, can be verified. The results will be apparent. You will thus be shown a fool on the spot if you go around saying things that do not come true. So Jesus uses this to his advantage. One early church father puts it like this. He says, Jesus performs the lesser miracle, which is more evident. That's healing the man's legs. So he calls that the lesser miracle to be a proof of the greater miracle forgiving his sins, which is imperceptible. We, we can't verify it. The power that heals, he says, whether soul or body is the same. I love that. That's key. Jesus knows that the power to do both is the same, but it's easier for us to perceive one than the other. But let the one be the authority, the truth, the trust that the other is true. Verse 6, he gives us the reason. He says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he goes back to the paralytic. So we have this side conversation with the scribes that gets to the, to the big point. Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. So just like that, the lesser miracle is done. Jesus spends much more time talking about the more difficult and the greater miracle of forgiving his sins because that is what Matthew wants us to take home. That's the difficult part. And if we think about the the miracle for just a moment, what a moment that is. Somebody who has never walked before. Think about crinkled up, dry bones and sinews and legs and the miraculous healing of a lame man who's gone through a lifetime of agony, probably of pain and immobility, probably low social class, not able to work, not able to feed himself, not able to relieve himself. And in an instant, his withered legs regain their might, brittle bones recover their strength, and he rises to his feet for the first time ever in front of a crowd of people, many of whom probably knew him as a lifelong lame man. A miracle as he gains his balance, learns how to walk for a second, and then proceeds to go home to his place. This miracle is Jesus bringing life to the valley of dry bones before before the crowd. He's verifying this. The prophet Ezekiel gets a vision in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded As I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. He's he's looking out before, and there's just dead human skulls and bones, skeletons, nothing, nothing there. Valley of dry bones, the valley of death. And looked, I behold, and there was sinews on them, the ligaments reform, things that had been gone are now made new, flesh had come upon them, skin had covered them, but yet there was no breath in them. So the Valley of Dry Bones is coming to life, and there's all of the physical structure for humanity to be remade, but there is no breath in them. Remember, the breath of God, as Adam was created by God from the dust of the ground, and there was physical matter, there was material, and God breathed life into him. Ezekiel continues, and then God said to the prophet, prophesy to the breath, the spirit. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. Remember the four rivers of creation in Eden. The four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel says, I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood on their feet. Dry bones have come alive in the prophets, and now Jesus, the ultimate prophet, comes.
comes and makes a man with dry bones rise. And in forgiving his sins, he breathes the breath of life into him. The man's soul is made new with the breath of Jesus and his legs are made new with the healing power of Jesus. So this miracle alone, just thinking through the actual miracle itself, is enough to bring us to worship. But remember Matthew, what he thinks is far more important is the reason he turned in the middle. He could have just told us about the healing, but he doesn't. He focuses more on the scribes. Jesus can heal all of your physical maladies. That is great. That is glorious, yes, and amen. But there's more, right? It gets better than that. What's far more difficult is healing your soul. The stubbornness of sin pervades. So think back to that line, the reasoning Jesus gives, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So think back to whatever authority Right? We don't live in a Cronkite age, but you give authority to people. Do you give authority like this to Jesus? He should have authority and dominion over every sphere of your life because he's going to be the one and the only one who can heal every area of your life. Just as Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount as one who has authority in himself, he demonstrates his authority to forgive sins by healing a lame man. One reformer says, even the Son of Man has power of forgiving sins, even then while living on earth in the form of a servant. Because even in that state of humility, he retained the same mind with the Father, and by his Spirit was the purifier of souls, for he is Christ today, yesterday, and forever. Okay, we just sang it. He doesn't change, and therefore he can change everything. Well, Jesus, even though he comes as man, is eternally unchanging, and thus he can change everything. He is Christ today, yesterday, and forever. Jesus is true God, true man, one with the Father in spirit, in Trinity, one with you and me in humanity which is exactly what we need. We need God, but we need us. We need a better human, the perfect human. And this central facet, the God-man, this is the great mystery that we call the incarnation, the second person of the Trinity being born in the flesh as a human to live, to give the righteousness that you and I could not have, but also to die and take the punishment that you and I deserve. This is why many in the crowds find Jesus and his words so difficult to grasp. It's difficult for them to reconcile what Jesus is saying and what they're seeing, because they're seeing, and they know it, they rightly see that Jesus is saying things that mean that he must be God, yet they fail to perceive, they do not have the faith in our words, to trust that Jesus actually is God. There's, there's a tension that they just cannot and won't reconcile yet. What they see in front of them is that Jesus heals, delivers, and saves before their very eyes. And that still makes them uneasy. Rather than worshiping and saying, I don't quite fully understand how this can be true, but I see it and I trust that it is true. The Christian faith is very, very rational. It's a, it's a good thing. We have a reasonable faith, but it is not a simple math equation that can be easily solved, as if you take true God, true man, put them together, and you know, one plus one equals trinity. Okay? There is paradox here. There is mystery here. And the key that Jesus is showing that the scribes just don't have yet is reconciling that tension. They want to place Jesus fully on one side or the other. They want, they want God speaking to, on the mountain from the clouds to Moses. They don't want Jesus doing the very things that God can do. The key to faith then is having the humility to trust what you cannot see or comprehend in your creatureliness by acknowledging that you are a creature. Faith asks that we don't disregard the mystery, but that you lean into the mystery 
And the mystery becomes sweeter all the more as the Spirit gives you eyes to see. It seems too good to be true that the one who created the world out of absolutely nothing would himself take on created flesh and bone, submitting himself to the creaturely ills of temptation and decay, defiling himself by being around poor beggars and lame men, but he did. And therefore, we have hope. One scholar says that Jesus is able to save us not only because he is fully like us, but also because he is completely different than us. Both are true at the exact same time. Jesus is fully like us, which is good news, but it's also good news that he's completely different than us, in a sense. The scribes were correct in crying out that only God can forgive sins, but what they failed to see is that Jesus is God, and thus Jesus has the full authority to forgive sins. So if you have been given eyes to see Jesus this morning, or if you have faith to see that he is who he says he is, you, like the lame man, will rise from your mat of sinful filth. And you will be forgiven, and you will be healed. And now living in this tension, right, we have the already and the not yet. Some of these things have become true to us. Healing is true. We went over that a few weeks ago. Sometimes that healing is delayed and it's difficult. But it is sure. It is true. Every single one who professes their faith in Christ will be given a glorified body with him. And we will be like him. And therefore, we will see him as he is. Our chief problem is sin, which is literally death, decay inside us. It's rot. Faith in Jesus heals both the body and the soul. The rot is in both. The corrosive effects pervade every aspect of our lives, both internally but also the world around us. Everything is decaying. We cannot escape that constant pull to want what we have not been given. We cannot pull ourselves out of the muck and the mire by our own bootstraps. We are dead in sin, and it is killing us just like it's killing creation. But God, Paul writes to the Ephesians, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Through the person and work of Jesus, sin is defeated and the curse is reversed. So sin and decay pervades but for the believer, sin and decay, you are no longer continuing in your slide of decay. The curse is working backwards. And when he comes in the blink of an eye in an instant, the curse will be completely reversed. Sometimes right now our bodily healing is put on pause in the tension. But you can take heart because if you are in Christ by faith, you will be raised with Christ on the last day and you will be given a new body and a new heart. We'll never be sick, injured, or broken. No more kids with constant runny noses. No more fevers. No more broken bones. No more digestive issues. No more intestinal issues. No more mental illness. No more anxiety. No more depression. No more cancer. No more death. That is the hope that we live in. And that is why this Sunday, like every Sunday, is a Resurrection Sunday. We proclaim the resurrection of Christ, and we proclaim his death until he comes again. So again, finally, the, the response. Every, every story that Matthew gives us, he gives a response, which, as we remember, Matthew's not writing a purely neutral, hey, take it or leave it. He was a disciple. He's writing these things to us so that we may believe. So he's giving us the response of the crowd so that we can test our own response when we see Jesus heal and forgive sins. 
He's writing these things so that we may have faith like the lame man and his friends. But look at the crowd's response. One, one commentator says, they are appropriately filled with awe, right? They have fear and wonder and amazement, but they fail to understand what they have seen. They glorify God for having given such authority to human beings, but they fail to understand that Jesus is not exercising the authority possible for human beings, but rather he is exercising the authority that only he can exercise because he is the human being. That's a key, a key distinction. Think about after the, the ascension and the resurrection of Jesus, he gives power to the disciples, to Christians, to do the same things, to perform miracles, to heal. They are not God, but they are doing acts of God. But their authority, remember, is derivative. Their authority is in the name of Jesus. So Jesus is performing miracles in a different way then the apostles will perform miracles later on that we'll see. So that's a, that's a key distinction. But here, it's, it's looking as if, and we don't get a ton, but it's looking as if the crowds are looking at them more as the, the later apostles. They're saying, wow, those are great works that you do. And so they glorify God rightly, which is true because the Father is sent eternally from, or the Son is sent eternally from the Father. So that they get part of it, but they don't quite equate that the Son and the Father are one equal in their Godhead, and thus equal in their ability to proclaim healing and forgiveness. So faith in Jesus is trusting that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, was born as a man to heal both your body and your soul. So your charge this morning is very simple. Believer or unbeliever, faith is a a process, a continual repentance, a continual act of faith that is not one and done. It is a life of faith. So to have faith and to know that Jesus can and will forgive you and heal you both now and forevermore is the charge for believer and unbeliever alike. And then to simply rest in that, to give Jesus full authority on heaven and on earth because he has full authority. He's demonstrated it. He's put his money where his mouth is. He's practiced what he's preached. And he's given you the power to go now and do as he did. That's what he calls his disciples to do. To be like him, resting in the power of the spirit, not in the power of the flesh, because you've been given a new heart by the spirit of God. So let your faith lead you into the presence of Jesus and let Jesus transform you by being simply in his presence all he asks for is faith and he will heal you and he will forgive you would you pray with me